Good afternoon, if you're joining us for our peer mentoring webinar. Um, we're just gonna wait a couple minutes to get started. But welcome, welcome. Thanks so much for being here today. And as you come in, if you wanna just let us know in the chat where you're dialing in from, your name, Awesome, so we have people coming to us from all over Chicago, Utah, Michigan, the UK, amazing, DC, Nebraska, Washington, Kansas. Wow, this is great. From Trinidad, from Indiana, Boston, Colorado, California. Welcome, anyone joining us. Um, just let us know in the chat where you're where you're calling in from. And we're just gonna get started in a couple minutes. We have people calling in from Canada, Vermont. We're so excited to be here today. We're gonna have a great conversation um, and share our new resource, which we're really excited about at Mentor. All right, so just to get us started, um, greetings everyone, I'm Martha with Mentor National. Um, I'm a support specialist for the NMRC. We'll tell you more about that in a little bit. Um, but just some details for participation today in the webinar. Um, please use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can submit questions to our panelists at any time throughout, and we will try to track those and answer them as we go. Um, if you do have comments or you know something to share with a colleague that you're you're seeing in our amazing chat from all over the world, um, feel free to use the chat box for that. But if you can keep your questions in the Q&A, that will help us organize them and get to them. Um, we do have live captions available. So if you click the CC at the bottom of your screen, the live transcript button, you'll be able to use those. We will have polls that we're gonna pull up in a couple minutes. So if you can respond to those, um, that'll be great so we can get a sense of who's with us today. Um, yeah, and if you're just joining us, uh, just introduce yourself in the chat, let us know where you're, where you're um, dialing in from. Thank you so much. So our webinars are all um, recorded and public and they become available on our NMRC website. So they're a great resource to share beyond the actual live webinar. Um, one week after this webinar, you will get an email um, to be able to access this recording and a PDF so that you'll be able to share that out with colleagues um, or use it, reference it if you'd like. Um, and it will be posted on nationalmentoringresourcecenter.org. So we have some exciting material today. Um, we'll first, we'll meet all of you with our polls. And then we're going to have a conversation with our peer mentoring experts from our Youth Advisory Council. They'll share personal stories, and they're really going to give us some great insights into the pitfalls of peer mentoring, what contributes to great peer mentoring, and the benefits overall of, of specifically using peer mentoring um, as a tool for connection and support of young people. Um, we'll also, at the end, this will be about a 45 minute conversation, and then we're going to take some good time at the end to really answer any of your questions that come up. So again, Q&A, the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen, please use that throughout to submit questions and we'll get to those at that part of the agenda. And then at the end, we do have um, some resources specifically about peer mentoring that we'd really like to share with you that go beyond this webinar. So we'll We'll share those and let you know how you can find those. Um, the National Mentoring Resource Center is funded through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, it's an agreement between um, 
OJJDP, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, Office of Justice Programs, and the US Department of Justice. Um, so the NMRC really builds on OJJDP's work and provides tons of resources and materials for, for mentoring, for um, mentoring young people and, and supporting programs and providing quality mentoring. The NMRC has a really significant amount of resources. It's like a library, basically. Um, we have an entire website with a blog um, that features great stories and personal experiences from um, grantees that run mentoring programs across the country. Um, there is a grantee dedicated part of the site where you can learn more about individual programs and the specific expertise they have in youth mentoring. Um, lots of evidence reviews and in-depth research um, about mentoring. Um, so it's just a great resource to use, to share, um, yeah, to send links to colleagues. And we have a research board that is consistently updating and adding new, new material in. We also provide no cost um, technical assistance for your youth mentoring program. So if there's you know, ever a time where you're trying to build your program or problem solve, we'll talk more about that at the end, but that is a big um, awesome component of the NMRC and a free resource um, for those of you across the country. Mentor itself um, is a unifying champion for mentoring across the country. Um, and we, we have the fourth elements of effective practice for mentoring, which is a resource available also on the NMRC. There are 24 state and local affiliates associated with mentor. So we have a whole network um, that, yeah, that we're really proud of and that uh, creates an entire network of leaders and um, thought exchangers across the country for mentoring. So we're ready to do our polls just to learn more about where all of you are coming from in terms of this topic of peer mentoring. So our first question is, do you currently feel qualified to do peer mentoring? So the poll should pop up and you should be able to select, we have yes, no, or somewhat, just trying to get a sense of how you're feeling on this topic as we, as we start the conversation. Our second question is, do you think that there are enough peer mentoring resources out there that you can use? And let us know if you don't think so and you need some, you, you do think so and you have used some. Um, and then finally, what is your role in mentoring? So are you coming into this webinar as a mentor, as a mentoring program, as a manager or coordinator, as a mentee? Are you maybe looking to get into mentoring or looking to be mentored? Um, funder, yeah, let us know your, your current role. Okay, awesome. So in terms of um, people feeling qualified to do peer mentoring, it looks like about half of you are saying um, somewhat, so somewhat qualified. Um, a third of you are saying yes. So you're, you're probably actively doing it, which is awesome. 16% are saying no. Okay, great. We're going to talk more today. Um, this is great. It's a good mix of all of us. Do you think that there are enough peer mentoring resources out there? Yeah, so it looks like most of us are not sure. Um, so we're super excited to share the, some resources today. And a third of you. Feel like you want some more resources. Great. All right, and it looks like we have a lot of managers and coordinators with us today, 64% of us. Five of you are mentors, 10 of you are mentoring programs. We have a mentee on here, awesome. Some of you are looking to get into mentoring. So we have, we have everybody here, this is, this is great. And again, if you're coming in, if you're just starting to join us, feel free to let us know where you're calling in from in the chat. 
So to get us started, um, one of the biggest reasons we wanted to do this webinar is because we have this new peer mentoring guide. And this really resulted from the amazing leadership of the Youth Advisory Council to the National Mentoring Resource Center. The Advisory Council meets regularly and um, brings up suggestions, needs, gaps in what is available on the NMRC. Um, so their work and their offerings are just invaluable to the creation of um, ongoing resources for the NMRC. Um, so the peer mentoring guide was something that came out of the Youth Advisory Council ideas and the Youth Advisory Council um, worked together to create it, to design it, to, um, yeah, to put it completely together in a, in a beautiful graphic way too, to really make it useful for all of us digitally and as a downloadable um, printable document that you could use beyond uh, the screen. Um, Yvette Cabrera, Rachel Estrella, Kendall Miller, and Grace Lynn were the uh, writers of this guide. Two of them, Rachel and Kendall, are here with us today to talk about it. Um, and we will let you know more about how to access it, but this guide is now available on the NMRC website for free to use, to download. Um, we do include the link here because we'll be sending out the PDF and you'll be able to easily access it from there after this webinar. So let's get right into a conversation with Rachel and Kendall. Um, here we are for our panel to talk about this, both the resource and kind of all of the experiences that went into creating the resource. Um, the name of our panel is The Power and Importance of Peer Mentoring. And I'm gonna introduce our panelists. So Rachel Estrella, Welcome, Rachel. Rachel is a recent graduate from Duke University who majored in neuroscience and history. She has spent several years as a peer mentor through programs at her high school and university and has benefited from peer mentorship in her undergraduate career. She has been a member of the National Mentoring Resource Center as Youth Advisory Council for a year um, and actually beyond that now and is continuing to work um, to make peer mentoring resources more equitable. So Rachel, welcome, we're so happy to have you. And Kendall, Kendall Miller is a full-time student, writer, mentoring advocate, and aspiring lawyer from Covington, K Kentucky. After being a mentee for four years, she served as a board member to her local mentoring program, Covington Partners, to help ensure that a student's perspective was shown in all mentoring related decisions. Now a freshman at the University of Louisville, She's pursuing a degree centered around restorative justice and peace studies. Kendall has worked with Mentor National as well as the NMRC on youth advocacy and establishing one of the first official peer mentoring guides, which we're introducing to all of you today. So welcome Rachel and Kendall, we're so excited to have you. Um, all of your consultant work for the NMRC is just amazing. So thanks for being with us today. So just to get us started, we wanted to first ask you, what is peer mentoring to you? And how did you get here? How did you get to this place um, of creating this peer mentoring guide? Um, I can I, I, go ahead and start. Uh, sorry, Rachel. No, you're great. <laughs> um, so uh, basically uh, peer mentoring, it can take a lot of different forms um, in a lot of different spaces. So my expertise lies in peer mentoring within academic settings, but it can also be in work settings, uh, outside organization, organizational settings, such as like extracurricular activities. Um, but yeah, it's basically a peer mentoring another peer, self-explanatory in the name. Um, but yeah, I've been working um, with mentoring and peer mentoring um, pretty much since I was was a freshman in high school. Um, I started uh, as a mentee and then with that experience it sort of equipped me to become a mentor myself. So Covington Partners actually started its peer mentoring program um, I think last year um, and I, last summer and I was able to sit in on some trainings. It was actually really awesome. I got to write this guide as this program was being established. So it was really cool, like giving and taking that information. Um, 
But yeah, so uh, I worked on that and now I'm starting a new mentoring position at my university um, where I'm serving as a student success ambassador where I'm uh, mentoring freshmen, incoming freshmen and helping them with the tran their transition to college, um, helping them, uh, you know, feel secure in their academic lives and also, you know, becoming more involved on campus and also just serving as that person that they can talk to, shoot an email to, you know, like, hey, I'm really stressed about this thing or I don't know where this building is. Uh, and I can be that person for them, which is super amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. It sounds like it's just naturally wrapped into your everyday. Yes. And yeah, that's awesome. Similarly to Kendall, my expertise in peer mentoring has been in an academic space. I also began as a mentee in high school, trying to make that transition from high school into college. And then when I got to college, I first began my peer mentorship in helping uh, students from my high school make the same transition. And then I also served as um, a peer mentor in the sense of um, this Duke has a program kind of called Student Buddies, where older upperclassmen students will guide younger students that have the same interests or uh, similar um, career kind of aspirations or academic interests. And you kind of pair up with these people and uh, tell them about different courses to take or different internship opportunities and different things like that. So I've served in that peer mentoring aspect as well. And also as um, a peer mentee in uh, like the neuroscience department at Duke University. University. So I've kind of had this diff different hats in like um, the world of peer mentoring, which I think has equipped me with a good experience to kind of help uh, make this or curate this really um, comprehensive guide that we're going to share with you all today. This is awesome. It's so yeah, it's so great to hear to hear both of your um, backgrounds in it and personal experiences with it. Um, and I know we also have another, another webinar coming up later in the summer for all of you on here, um, specifically about supporting um, young people in those, in those transitions that you were talking about, Rachel. So that's, that's gonna be really exciting as well. And I think we did pull, um, as we are having this conversation, we did pull some key points that, um, that we pulled from the guide that Rachel and Kendall, you, you both um, pulled from the guide. Um, so I believe we can move to some of those. Um, yeah, do you both wanna say just a little bit more about your experience with the Youth Advisory Council? Um, Cause it'd be great to get that background as well. Yeah, so, um... Uh, as uh, Martha mentioned earlier, there's two other people, two other authors of the guide who sadly are not here. Um, but I really wanted to say, like, just establish that this webinar is very supplementary to the, the peer mentoring guide. Um, we definitely, we talk about some key points and we talk about things that were most impactful for us and able to be, you know, uh, most digestible in this format when we talk and present uh, about them. But I really, really encourage you guys to, after this, to really utilize that resource because we work, we work so hard. We pretty much had a say in every single little thing about the guide from the colors that were used to the format that it's in, to the language that was used. I mean, we sort of built it up, built it from the ground up. Um, so it's kind of like our little, our little baby. I think all of us are really, really proud of it. Um, and we also really worked hard on like providing uh, super awesome and tangible examples in the guide. That was something that we really wanted to focus on because um, I, I can't speak for everyone, but uh, from my experience uh, working with students and just uh, me, um, it's really easily easy to contextualize things and put them into practice when you have that, you know, provided to you. Um, but yeah, working with the guy with the uh, working on the guide with. Uh, um, Rachel and Yvette and Grace was a really uh, awesome and wonderful experience. Uh, we met, I'd say, like uh, t probably twice a month. I think that's probably like a good uh, estimate of time. And we worked on it for a while um, from like the beginning to the end. I think it was roughly almost a year, which is a little bit crazy. Um, 
but yeah, we worked super hard on it. We actually pulled, uh, you can see them on the screen, the screen here. We pulled quotes um, from peer mentors and mentees um, from different mentoring programs, uh, which is uh, super awesome and just a great way to really, again, to contextualize everything and really feel grounded uh, in the content that you're reading. So yeah, um, even, even though like I was a part of writing this guide, I learned a lot um, from uh, my other counts, council members um, and also seeking out information for this guide was just a really impactful experience for me. And I think all in all uh, made me uh, not only a better mentor, but a men better mentee as well. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things about creating the guide was just doing it with people with such different experiences and backgrounds, which really made it, uh, I think, uh, a great resource that we ended up making because we were able to see um, different oversights where someone may have forgot this and we're like, oh, but I've had experience and mentoring in this way and, and this is what I learned from it. So being able to take different experiences to really create something cohesive that I think touches on a lot of areas of peer mentoring that are uh, make for successful peer mentoring relationships, I thought it was a really great job done by us. Yeah, I love that you're. I love that you're bringing up the collaborative element of that, and I feel like that really speaks to the Youth Advisory Council overall. And yeah, the amazing, the amazing ability to collaborate like that that you've all brought. And um, it was great, Kindle, that you pointed out the um, the different scenarios that and examples that you're pulling out in the guide, because um, I think those are really helpful in terms of taking the key points that you're, you're making and making them um, kind of real life. So yeah, everyone on the webinar, you'll be able to see some of those as we move through. Um, so just as our next question for you, what are some of the potential pitfalls of getting into peer mentoring? What are, what are some of the you know, possible risks of it? Um, and do you have any examples of what could go wrong, um, you know, either as a mentee being mentored within peer mentoring um, or um, the peer mentoring aspect of it itself? Sure, I can answer that first. I think um, one of the uh, larger uh, components of creating and establishing a successful peer mentoring relationship would be boundaries. And that's one thing that we really emphasized in our guide. Um, establishing clear boundaries in the beginning of your peer mentorship relationship, like whether you're the, the mentor kind of facilitating this relationship or you're a mentee coming to someone asking um, to kind of establish a, a relationship. Establishing boundaries in the beginning is really important and um, sort of uh, keeping tabs with how your relationship is changing and uh, making sure that these boundaries are, are still in place or, or do they need to change with how your relationship is changing. I think um, things could go wrong if those boundaries aren't established and it's unclear, like how do we communicate? How often do we communicate? What's the type of information that I want from you? What, um, what kind of um, What's, what's, what are we receiving and what are we giving from this relationship? I think those boundaries are ones that really need to be established. And then also just things about like, how often do we communicate? How do we communicate? What's acceptable for us to talk about? What's maybe not? I think just establishing those things and, and making it really clear um, what the relationship is about and, and what, um, what makes it successful for both the, the mentor and the mentee is something that's really important, I think, to establish in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and something that I kind of have seen um, and experienced throughout my time in mentoring, uh, even when I was a mentee myself and I would talk to, you know, other mentees, um, is oftentimes mentoring can really, um, if not done right, it can feel sort of like a chore for some mentees. I've had mentees um, be like, oh no, I have mentoring today. And you never, you never want that. Um, especially like if you're in, a, you're in a structured environment and you have like, okay, like once a week, I have this set amount of time with my mentor. Um, sometimes, you uh, those little uh, disconnects can lead to your mentee feeling that way. And you never, never, ever want that to happen. Um, so I'd say a way of kind of combating this is um, 
like what Rachel said, setting boundaries from the very beginning um, and also setting goals as to like what you want from the relationship initially, have that like first initial conversation between a uh, peer mentor and mentee and say like, hello, like I'm your mentor and this is sort of my role. Um, and just ask like, what are you hoping to get out of this? And be honest too, and be open with yourself. And like, this is what I'm hoping to get out of this because um, we talk about in the guide how uh, a peer mentor and mentee relationship, it's very symbiotic. You guys, it's a give and take. You guys are both learning uh, from each other. So as long as you keep that mindset um, going into the relationship and also, you know, take it slow, like Rachel said, set those boundaries. Um, you'll be able to kind of avoid that um, chore mindset where uh, your mentee is like, oh no, I have to see my mentor today. Cause you never want that. You never want that. Um, and that's kind of a sign that, you know, there's been a disconnect in your relationship. Mm -hmm. And one that's thing that cool. I really love in the guide at the end, we kind of have an example uh, communication or, or a starter template for starting that mentoring relationship. And there's some great questions on there, some uh, for your for a mentor to give to their mentee to fill out and kind of like have a, a starting point for the relationship. And I think it's like a really great example of how to set those boundaries, but also how to get to know your mentee, how to make the relationship fun and work for both people in it. That's awesome. That's awesome to know that that's in the guide. I was gonna ask, I was gonna ask you both to talk more about, yeah, how, how you set up those boundaries, what, what those conversations really, really sound like. Um, so that's, that's awesome. We can, we can um, pull that out with the guide. Okay, this is great. Um, and I think that we do, if we want to move through the slides, I think we do have some of, um, some of your key points on the same, same question about possible pitfalls. Um, yeah, I know, I know you wanted to impress upon people that mentoring will never be one size fits all. There'll be different and unique ways um, of interacting between mentors and mentees. We have a couple more. Yeah, the symbiotic relationship. You spoke a lot about this, both of you. Mentor and mentee oftentimes have a symbiotic relationship in which they both learn and grow together. And again, a mentor-mentee match will not always be perfect. It's a really good reminder. Sometimes the connection doesn't happen immediately and that's completely okay. These are great. Um, these are some of the things that Rachel and Kendall pulled out from the guide just to um, you know, support this conversation. So again, for anyone who's joined recently, we'll be, we'll be sharing out the entire guide and how to download it. Um, and like Rachel just said, there'll be you know, full templates for actual conversation starters to develop the relationship. So moving on to what has been really productive in developing good peer mentorship in terms of what you've witnessed, um, what contributes to good peer mentorship? I can go ahead and start uh, with this one. Um, and this is something I'm really passionate about because sometimes it's very easy to feel like um, if the right connection isn't created, it's easy to feel like stagnant or like I mentioned before, like a bit of a chore, like you're, you're doing it out of obligation rather than um, because you want to and you never want that to happen. Um, so uh, my sort of biggest uh, uh, piece of advice that I offer to people to that, that really helps to contribute to a good and like effective a peer mentorship uh, relationship uh, is going in with uh, a mindset and really preparing yourself to be open uh, with your mentee. And uh, while I was working with Covington Partners um, and uh, their training sessions for their peer mentors, uh, there was sort of this uh, little uh, piece or like section of the training that really stuck out with me. Um, and basically we talked about how as a mentor, it's not your job uh, to judge what is good and what is bad for your mentee. Like it's completely up to your mentee to decide what is good for them. Um, 
what path they need to be on. And as a mentor, your, your job um, or your role is to support them through that and uh, give them the advice or give them the guidance when they ask for it, um, but to let them feel like they uh, have the hands on the steering wheel of their own future, you know? So um, a really impactful example that I was talking to my mentoring coordinator about um, that sort of ties along with this is we talked about how um, when your mentee like opens up to you and you know shares a bit of information with you to not like jump right in and make like a value judgment about what they said. So for example, like if your mentee, and this is sort of like a bit of a heavy example, but it's something that could very much happen. Um, if your mentee opens up to you and they might be a young person and they're like, hey, like I'm pregnant, your job isn't supposed to be, oh my goodness, you're young, that's bad, you're not prepared, because then it makes your mentee shut down, be like, oh no, I shouldn't have said anything, you know, I was opening up to you, not, it, not necessarily for advice or a judgment, but just to be like heard, to, you know, felt like the mentee was being heard in that moment, felt like they were being seen in that moment. So something that I talk about in the guide is to really ask those guiding questions to just sort of garner how your mentee feels about it because you don't know your mentee could be happy that they're expecting they you know they might be sad or they might be happy you never know you don't know you're not in their shoes so um in the guide I talk about asking those questions like so how do you feel about that you know like what what is what can I do to be helpful to you in this situation even if you may have like separate like personal values that's completely okay you you two are you're your own two unique complete uh people um, but your job is not to uh, patronize your mentee or, you know, act as like a parent. Um, the role you want to play is definitely um, just that guiding role, you know, not uh, sort of laying down those judgments because um, oftentimes mentees, what they want the most out of a mentor is to just feel heard, feel seen. Um, and not feel judged because probably, especially if you're in a, a, a peer setting, they're probably getting that judgment a lot from other spaces. So you really wanna play that role of the non-judging and just uh, the accepting um, and the guiding. Mm -hmm. And like Kendall said, I think one of the really productive elements of a good um, peer mentorship relationship is open communication. So that mentee feeling like they can go to their mentor open and honestly without right the judgment and ridicule. But also I think I've learned as a peer mentee that sometimes it is hard to be, have open communication with your mentor and to be honest about maybe some of the resources or the suggestions and advice you're receiving. And it's, it's hard sometimes to go to your mentor and be like, I don't think this is going to work for me, like the resource or advice or the next step that we talked about. I don't know if that's for me. I'm sort of feeling a different way about it. I think it's important for um, your a peer mentee to be able to kind of make those uh, judgments and, and, and communicate that openly with their mentor, because it's not like a relationship where the mentor uh, has to say exactly what the mentee needs to do and the mentee needs to follow it immediately. Like, I think the mentee has to, especially in a peer setting, which might be difficult to say to someone who feels like your peer or your friend, but it is important for the mentee uh, as well to communicate openly and honestly about what they think is right for them and to communicate with that uh, to their mentor. It just makes for a stronger and more productive relationship. Thank you so much for these examples. This is, these are really, really great. Um, and what would you, do you both have, um, you know, just thoughts and advice about, cause kind of the examples you both gave, it sounds like, you know, deep trust needs to be, be there in the, in the relationship and peer mentorship. Um, do you have, do you have just thoughts on, you know, how to develop that trust, how to approach, you know, from the, from the mentee also, um, you know, how to, how to approach that relationship also. So the trust building on the mentor side um, and, and the mentee side. Hmm. I think it, it comes, definitely comes with time. You're just um, building a relationship um, 
that's shown to be like trustworthy if you prove yourself trustworthy in the relationship but also just on the baseline of getting to know each other so um just from the beginning like a, a mentor showing that they really have interest in their mentee as a person um in terms of their goals and their uh like career aspirations showing you're interested and then also showing that you're like personally invested in their well-being and seeing them succeed in their personal life in their social life in their uh, career or academic life as well i just think showing that interest and getting to know that person makes us makes for a strong foundation to build trust and, and then um you know success yeah i definitely agree and something that was really helpful to me um when i first started um, just being a mentee, uh, I definitely was not open to any sort of like vulnerable relationship at all when I initially started mentoring, um, especially like um, if you take into account like um, the background that your mentee might be from, um, sometimes uh, opening and starting relationships like that uh, can be really difficult. So I just say, um, what really helped for me is taking things very slowly. Um, and I think uh, something that was really helpful that my mentor did for me was sort of take things at my own pace um, and just sort of allowed me to like slowly open up and like bloom into someone who like uh, can communicate, especially when it comes to like things that might be, you know, rather like upsetting or uh, traumatic even. Um, so just allowing, like I said before, allowing your mentee to really kind of uh, decide when the time is to, you know, uh, share things and open up about things. Um, I'd say that was probably uh, most helpful, definitely most helpful, helpful for me. And also like uh, you're as a mentor asking follow up questions. So sort of what Rachel was talking about was really showing that commitment. So your mentee might, you know, open up to you about something that happened at school that day or at work that day that was really upsetting for them. As I mentioned before, just, you know, how do you feel about that? You know, is there anything I can do? Um, what's a potential like solution that you, what's a potential solution to this problem? Are there any resources that I can help provide to you um, to sort of help solve that problem? So yeah, as I mentioned before, just sort of uh, do away with those value judgments. Um, you know, obviously be empathetic um, when the time calls. Um, but yeah, just allow your mentee to kind of go at their own pace and um, adjust to that pace and follow up and show your commitment. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it, sounds, it sounds like a lot of practice listening also, deep listening, um, which I know we talk a lot about with, with mentorship um, in, all, in all areas. And just to kind of bring it back to the first question we talked about, I know you, you said some, some really um, helpful things about the boundary setting and clear communication in the beginning and then this kind of trust building. Do you recommend that, the, that people revisit those kind of communication agreements kind of periodically um, throughout the peer mentorship relationship? 100%, 100%. Uh, as you guys get closer, um, you might be more comfortable with like calling or texting or whatever the structure of your program allows. Um, so yeah, I think also that's another huge thing to building trust too is, you know, being consistent with boundaries. And like you said, revisiting them, um, like, hey, I know you said like you were and weren't comfortable with this set of things. Is there anything that has changed? Is there anything um, that I could do, you know, better? Um, do you think I'm doing a good job at upholding these boundaries? And also like have the mentee and the mentor, like it, it goes both ways, you know, holding up boundaries goes uh, both ways uh, completely. So I think both parties like set from the very beginning of the re relationship, setting it up to where um, the first thing, you know, you guys start talking about is setting boundaries for the both of you. And then as you guys get closer, as the trust like builds, those boundaries can shift and change. So it's really important to very frequently, you know, check up on those. And I also think like looking into feedback and revisiting boundary like establishments really shows like from the mentor side, like 
your positive like investment in the relationship and like seeing it succeed like on the long term scale. So I think that's really good again in in building trust and furthering a, a successful relationship. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much for these these specifics. Um, and I know we have some wisdom coming up through the chat also. Um, yeah, as a mentor, it's very important for the mentee. They don't feel that they're going to be judged. Um, yeah, so let's just move through the slides because I just want to make sure we pulled out um, a couple more a couple more pieces from the guide that we're all going to be able to use soon. Um, Boundaries, I know we talked, we just talked about a lot, which is great. Thanks for all those details. Really creating the comfort for the mentee. Um, yeah, this was a really great point that we pulled out. Some mentees may prefer virtual meetings while others may prefer in-person. Um, be sure to prioritize the safety and comfort. Yeah, is, have there been things just with, with more digital um, communication in the past several years? Um, I know there's some details in the guide that we can get to, but just, just quickly before the next question, um, are there specific, specific communication boundary related tips that you'd have um, around like virtual versus in-person if you're mentoring? Um, I would say uh, it, it's, it's sort of different whether, you know, you're, how structured so if you're a peer, if you're a peer mentor um and like sort of related to a program so you programs usually will have those like established uh boundaries when it comes to uh communication via like uh, virtual settings um so i think this is more of like delegated to the mentoring programs themselves is sort of um making sure it's it's sometimes it's really helpful to provide those boundaries uh, for the the mentors because if you're if you're a peer it just it, there's a difference between like a mentor and mentee and then a peer mentor and a peer mentee because uh, I think Rachel was talking about this earlier sometimes it's easy uh, for the lines to be blurred a little bit when uh, you guys are peers so I think uh, I think it's really important for programs to really sort of set um, those standards and those expectations for the mentors because sometimes as a mentor you don't you don't really know you know you're you're not an expert um, and it's unfair to sort of expect them to know everything um, all at once so I think that's to summarize it's the mentoring program's job to sort of make sure the mentor knows uh, what is appropriate what isn't appropriate and also you know uh, for mentoring coordinators or program leaders to, you know, sort of ask the mentees that they're serving and, hey, like, what is something, what, like, what are things that you would be comfortable with uh, this via this kind of communication? What are some things that you wouldn't be comfortable with um, establishing, like, times, durations of, of meetings and calls, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. And I think now, uh, like, virtual meetings and communication seems to be, like, overrun by Zoom uh, in the COVID years, but on a, like, one-to-one -one kind of peer mentoring level, like, a virtual meeting could be a FaceTime, but I think that has to be communicated between a peer mentor and a mentee, like, are you comfortable with me FaceTiming you? Like, you know, it, it kind of has to be um, communicated between both parties and then uh, established as a norm or as a, we don't really do that, so I think that's important. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Thanks for that that advice. Because yeah, with the, the that kind of communication can get cut, just kind of move in a certain direction. Um, so it's great to give that advice that you're saying you're saying like be be really straightforward about how what, what platforms we're going to use. Mm -hmm. um, just as we continue this conversation, just a reminder to everyone: um, feel free to put any questions you have in the Q and A. You have the Q and A um, at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to. Um, we, we are gathering questions there that we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, and just to read one more uh, piece of wisdom from the chat, um, which also relates to this, what we're talking about, the trust building, relationship building from Anne, as a mentor uh, must have a true listening ear. The body language from a mentor can give the mentee the atmosphere of trust. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, okay, and then another another um, quick 
advice from the guide related to this, um, related to building productive peer mentoring. Try your best to be actively mindful of the differences between you and your mentee when it comes to different lived experiences and identities. We suggest asking questions such as, in what topic should I seek to educate myself on to best serve my mentee? And how can I account for our differences? So these are, these are great um, pieces of you know, important, important advice for engaging in peer mentoring. I don't know if there's anything else you want, you, either of you wanna say on, on any of these pieces from, from the guide before we, we move on to our next question. Um, I feel like you both gave some great examples of open-ended questions like these, the re reaffirming statements. How do you feel about that? Is there anything you're worried about? What do you need to help accomplish this goal? We heard some of those um, open-ended questions from both of you. So let's, let's get to what some of your um, big takeaways are from your, your peer mentoring experiences. And, and then also in general, what do mentors and mentees have to gain from peer mentoring? Um, but first, just some big takeaways from, from each of your experiences. My, uh, I guess, biggest takeaway from my peer mentoring experience is really um, sort of really feeling uh, that connection with uh, youth and like youth culture in your community. I think it's really kind of a beautiful um, and an amazing uh, experience. Um, Cause I know a lot of like peer mentor, peer, peer mentee relationships, it has a lot to do with young people um, and young people sort of learning to grow and like navigate in this crazy world, especially um, as of recently, um, especially with, uh, I know a lot of peer mentor mentoring programs really focus on like sort of the high school area and high school is a little bit crazy with standardized testing and graduating, especially, um, you know, emerging from a pandemic. So sort of my, yeah, biggest takeaway is really, um, you know, uh, garnering youth perspective, even though I'm a young person my, myself, um, it really helps you get sort of a wider, a wider view. Um, sometimes it's really easy to be stuck within your own perspectives and your own lived experiences. And as we mentioned before, like your, your mentee can have so many different identi identities that you don't identify with personally, but that you can learn so much from. Um, and that, you know, from that, you know, be equipped with so much information to not only become a better mentor, but, you know, a better friend, a better partner, or a better community member. Um, so, yeah, I just say uh, my biggest takeaway is just that community connection um, and that growth um, is something that's super, super invaluable. And I think something that's really unique to a peer mentoring experience. Yeah, I totally agree. That sense of like community and specifically with peer mentoring, like empowering your own generation. I really like love that aspect of peer mentoring. And that's one of the greatest things I've taken away from it. I also think like we just have as peers, as, as youth, sometimes we're, we're constantly, you know, getting information from people who are older than us. But when you start to look around to the people who are uh, right around your age, you see how much we have to give to each other and how much we have to learn from each other. So I think that's something that I've really uh, gained in general from being both a peer mentor and a peer mentee. And I think it's, it's something really great to gain being involved in that relationship, just sort of finding a sense of purpose in the things that you've been through and being able to share your kind of expertise now with other people who are trying to go through the same thing. So I think it's really exciting and great and amazing to be a part of. This is great. This is, this is great. Yeah, to hear, just to hear your overall, um, just, yeah, just love for peer mentoring and all of the, all of the possibilities in it. And we have some great questions coming in from all of you. Um, there's one really specific one I'd love to ask first. What is what are some of the um, age ranges that you've seen? Difference in age between mentors and mentees. 
within this framework of peer mentoring? Is there kind of like a, a cutoff you would say, or? I don't know if there's a strict cutoff in my mind, but in my experience, the peer mentoring range has been like about a four or five year age difference at the most. I don't know if you have any, can you? Yeah, I agree with that, especially if you're in an academic setting. I think when you're, you're in an academic setting, that's when age sort of really matters the most. Um, but as I sort of talked about before, sorry, I just dropped something. Um, as I sort of talked about before, uh, peer mentoring, we most see it in sort of academic context, but when you're sort of outside of academic context, it can be a little different. And I think that's when age matters a little bit less. So for example, if it's like a work-based context. Um, I feel like uh, your coworkers might not be the same age as you, but they're still like peers in a sense, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I'd say definitely in an academic context, age matters a lot. And uh, I agree with Rachel. Usually the cutoff I see um, is maybe like four to five years. Usually like uh, you want your mentor and your mentee to be in like the same sort of situation. So whether it be like high school or middle school or college, you want them to either, you know, both be in college or have one, you know, in college and one about to be in college. Uh, but that's sort of uh, the typical relationships I tend to see. That sounds that sounds great. Yeah, to get to get that advice, especially about the different contexts, work, work and school. Um, and to follow up on that, we had a good question about specifically an academic setting. So um, this question was from Susan. Our student leaders allocate peer mentors, which are also students, but the students choose their um, non-student mentors or college mentors from the pool. So do you have any advice about allocating um, the, and creating the choice? It sounds like the, there's like a group of peer mentors and then there's a group of students looking to be mentored. Um, any advice about pairing them or creating a situation where they're, they're selecting each other? I think that's, I think that's the question. Susan, if you mm. want to add any um, clarity, that's great too. But yeah, any advice on that, Rachel and Kendall? In, in my experience, sometimes with setting up like pools of mentors, um, we've had uh, like a kind of questionnaire that's sent out to people, whether it's like a Google form or some written document. And it's kind of like, what are you looking for? Um, what are your interests? And what are your, some of your goals? And then you can match mentors and, and mentees who might have similar interests or uh, someone who's in a position where one of the mentees is looking to be. So that's like a good way to match people without necessarily having to compete, I guess, for a certain <laughs> mentor. Yeah, I, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I definitely like the idea of sort of making it like goal oriented, um, focusing, like matching based on that. Um, because I have sort of experienced both where uh, some people wanted to choose their mentor, while like, your mentor was just given to you based on like, uh, predisposed information. And from my experience, um, choosing, it can either be like really awesome because the mentee, obviously if they're choosing their mentor, they're already, they wanted that person. They're already, you know, psyched to sort of have uh, a relationship with the person that they're choosing. Um, but like Rachel said, I think it might lead to um, competition or like um, people ended up ending up feeling disappointed with the mentor that they got and that might start off the relationship in a way that isn't like super awesome. So I like a lot, like what Rachel said, um, it was just sort of uh, matching two people together based on, on interests, based on identities, based on, you know, what goals they both had in mind for the relationship, because then it's, the relationship is set up a lot more on principle, which is a lot I think a lot more of a stable foundation foundation than just choice. That's great. That's great advice. That's awesome advice. Um, thank you so much. Okay. And then in terms of, we have another question at the high school academic setting level. Um, as a coordinator for a new program at the high school where I teach, 
what is my role when it comes to overseeing peer mentors, when it comes to topics that concern the safety and well being of the mentee students? So there's peer mentoring happening in, in a high school setting. Yeah. So um, I worked uh, in, I work still really closely with my mentoring coordinator who works in a high school and who runs um, an adult. Uh, an adult and like a youth uh, mentoring program and also a peer mentoring program. So she has a lot on her plate, but she's super awesome and wonderful about it. And I think what makes her really awesome at her job, shout out to Miss Kate, by the way, I think she's on this webinar. Um, I think what makes her really awesome um, is one, uh, establishing relationships with uh, peer mentors, peer mentees, and like mentees who are being mentored by, by adults. I think she really, works super hard, um, even though it may be a lot of kids, I think she works really hard um, in trying to get to know them, um, understanding, again, the youth culture, understanding what they might be comfortable with, um, consistently talking and checking up on them about their mentoring experience, um, and also checking in with mentors as well. Um, and also, I think one of the best things that um, a peer men, a, a, court, a mentoring coordinator can provide, I sort of talked about this earlier, is really providing and setting up um, those boundaries and helping uh, your peer mentors and just your regular, you know, adult mentors, really helping them um, learn how to be comfortable and consistent with setting boundaries and helping their mentees set boundaries. Um, and I think in our guide, we actually have a section for mentoring program, like advice for mentoring uh, uh, programs starting uh, peer mentoring programs. So um, I, of course, once this webinar is over um, and you're still looking for more information on that, I definitely recommend checking out the guide because we, I think we have like a whole section dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, an important role in this would be like being more uh, active in the establishment of boundaries, like you said, and also like checking in on those boundaries and checking in on the feedback. Like you might have to be a part of that mentor mentee um, sharing of information in terms of uh, do I feel like this is a successful uh, relationship? Do I feel safe? Is this comfortable? Like even if it's like a, a once a month uh, like form that the mentor and the mentee fill out and you just check in on, okay, how are, how are each party feeling in the relationship? Are there any uh, ways we could make this more comfortable? Does everybody feel safe? I think just facilitating the relationship in that way is something that's really important and helpful. That's great, that's great. Um, okay, and this is awesome because we're getting questions kind of at every level of, of, um, of mentoring and, and a transition for young people. Um, I know you just mentioned Kindle that in the guide um, there is a whole there is a whole bunch of recommendations for mentoring programs who are looking to start peer mentoring. We actually did get this question, so if you just want to touch on some advice, um, Rachel and Kindle, what advice do you have for mentoring programs who currently are operating a one-to-one -one youth adult mentoring program but really want to start offering peer mentoring or supporting peer mentoring? How would you how would you recommend they transition to that or add that in? Yeah. Um, I definitely would. Oh, you no, go ahead. sorry, go ahead. Okay, I would say I uh, definitely recommend like kind of polling the the youth that you have in the program already because a lot of the times I think people want to be mentors like they they love people people in general love talking about themselves and love giving advice or sharing their experiences. So I think if you found within your own pool uh, youth that wanted to mentor and then saw like a gap or, or a, another group of youth that needed mentoring, I think that's often a, like a, a good way to start and also a, a way that youth who need mentoring are more likely to volunteer or like um, search for it is, is if it's in a peer setting. So I think that would be a great way to start. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, so yeah, definitely utilizing um, the, the kids that you already have. Um, and also I think just being very clear about like what you're hoping to get out of the peer mentoring uh, program, like what the goals of the program are. And also like in the guide, I, we talk about like how, how 
peer mentors themselves can benefit. So I think uh, explaining that to them as well, just so it doesn't seem like another like responsibility, uh, especially if you're doing it in an academic setting because they probably have enough uh, responsibility. Um, and also I think uh, utilizing the resources around you to sort of find people who would be a good fit. So whether that be like teachers or counselors, they can help recruit um, for peer mentors or mentees, you know, like, oh, I think this uh, specific kid would really benefit from a peer mentor relationship. Oh, I think this kid would be a really awesome candidate um, to be a peer mentor. So I'd say definitely, utilize your resources well, um, talk to people, send out those emails, even if you think it, you might not get a response. Because um, from there, I think you can really build a solid group of people. And if the program is small at first, that's completely okay, because you probably want to start out with a smaller batch of kids anyways. Um, especially, I know for veteran coordinators, it can be really, really hard because um, they are managing so much at once and managing so many uh, people at once. So uh, that's my advice is utilize your resources, re reach out to those people and start out small. It's completely okay. Um, and just be patient with yourself and be patient with uh, your kids. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you, do you think, do you recommend just even just starting a couple, one or two or three your mentoring relationships to start they're trying to build it into the program yeah I think it's really uh uh open to what the mentoring coordinator uh is up for um like from my experience my mentoring coordinator she's been working as a coordinator for a, like a while um and she's obviously she's really awesome at her job so I think she started out uh roughly I'd say like uh seven to 10 people, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, that's an estimate. Um, but she started off with that um, based on like what she's most comfortable with, what she thinks she can handle and also with the people and, and the, the people that were provided to her and recommended to her. Um, so yeah, I think there's, I think it's really up to the mentor coordinator to sort of uh, wiggle, sort of wiggle around, sort of test, test the water, see. Um, and I think it's better to start like small and then add people than to start like with too many, if that makes sense. So yeah, just really under like trying to garner what you think you'd be most comfortable with and also putting into perspective, putting into perspective your other responsibilities that you have as a, a mentoring coordinator or program leader. That's, that's awesome. And, and in this same, this same um, kind of subject, what about um, group mentorship work? This is another question from our audience. Um, do you have experience with peer mentorship within group mentorship work? In other words, where a group of one-on-one -on -one mentor mentee pairs are working together? Have you seen I'm that? I personally don't have experience with um, a groups, like two pairs working together, but I've had experience with um, one person having more than one peer mentor. But I don't know. What about you, Kendall? Um, this is a really interesting uh, sort of uh, question. Uh, and it sort of has my brain uh, going a little bit. Personally, I haven't been uh, in, a, in a sort of group peer mentoring setting um, or even like a group mentoring setting at all. Um, Cause I think mentoring, uh, mentoring is kind of that standard is that is, it's a one-to-one -one sort of thing. Um, but one thing I have been a part of is um, like group uh, group when when I worked with uh, the peer mentoring program um, in my area it was sort of a group like training and all the peer mentors were sort of working together and learning uh, together how to be mentors so I'm familiar in, in that sort of context and I think in that context it's really awesome um, because uh, they're learning together so it feels less um, less like it's a singular like responsibility for them. It feels more like they're undergoing this process and they're learning with other people who are starting from scratch just like them. So I understand it in, in that sort of context, but in terms of like just uh, 
mentoring in a group, um, I'm not too familiar. Okay. No, I mean, that's good just to hear, just to hear that experience for sure. Um, this is, this is an interesting question that came up also from the audience in the academic peer mentoring setting, how can the program avoid stigmas in regard to students who are, who are mentees? Maybe, you know, maybe if there are stigmas about, um, they, they put in quotes, those students all need math help, et cetera, as an example. Um, so I think any stigma around being, being a mentee within peer mentoring. Mm. I think uh, it might depend, especially in a program setting, like how it's marketed or kind of pubbed to uh, people looking to be mentees or mentors. Maybe um, you should like kind of, I don't want to say advertise, but advertise the, the program as something that's not necessarily like a tutoring or it means that you're bad at life and you need all the advice you can get, but as something that's like really productive and fun and that uh, is like, is for everyone, not just people who, you know, are, are like in a, for a specific academic subject. It can, it can be in the academic setting, but extend past like coursework and um, grades and things like that. It can really just be like a, a support um, for being in the academic setting, like balancing studying and, and having fun or trying to get to a certain point in your academic career. I guess it could just be advertised as something that's mutually beneficial for both people and not something that's uh, suggesting that you're need, in need of dire help because I don't know. I don't know if that made sense, but. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. what you said about the kind of the advertising of up front, the words, the words that are used around, around like building the program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I definitely agree. It's all about how um, the program culture, I guess, itself is um, uh, sort of, uh, again, advertised. That's the only word I can think of. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, like Rachel said, uh, there's a huge difference between like tutoring and mentoring. And I think if you aren't clear about what exactly, because sometimes like it, it's very possible that um, your peer mentors and your mentees have never like, heard of like a structured mentoring program before so it's very possible that they could like um you know view it in like an academic like oh this is like a tutoring thing and I think that's definitely how like stigmas like that can sort of pop up um but I think one of the beautiful things about um peer mentoring is that since the 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 pair are already peers um, they have that very like uh, wonderful and unique experience to sort of come from um, at least the same uh, culture in terms of like the school or whatever like st structural setting this program is taking place in. Um, so I think um, that in itself can inherently sort of push away stigmas. But yeah, I think uh, sort of moving the, shifting the focus from academia to more like um, of a guiding, uh, supportive role, I think, uh, will help sort of shift people's minds away from, you know, grades and GPA and test scores and that sort of thing. Cause I mean, there's enough of that already. There's enough like tutors available. There's enough teachers available. Um, yeah. Okay. That's great. That's great. Um, we do have a couple more questions, but we wanted to be able to share out more information about the other resources we have um, before we wrap up. Um, but we do have, we have someone in our audience who is interested in having you both as guest speakers. So we will follow up about that um, and provide, provide some connection. Um, and just before, just to kind of you know, send us out with your wisdom. Is there any, you know, for everybody on this call, um, what's, what's just one thing that you really want people to take away from this conversation um, and all your experiences with peer mentoring before we share out our resources? I would just reiterate how beneficial peer mentoring is for both the mentor and the mentee and how empowering it can be in both roles. Um, uh, 
and how um, important it is to set boundaries, communicate openly, and um, as a mentor, really um, kind of evaluate what your mentee wants from the relationship and adhere to those and um, just be ready to create a, an awesome, open, flourishing relationship. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, yeah, uh, I'd say main takeaways is please look at this guide. Um, we kind of put our heart and soul into it. And like, no matter how much we, even if we were on this webinar for another hour, I don't think we'd be able to like properly give justice to the um, like extremely valuable information that's in this guide. Um, I mean, it was written by peer mentors, for peer mentors, for mentees, for mentoring programs. We really tried to hit all of the bases on who might be able to uh, consume uh, this information. Um, so yeah, uh, even if it seems like a lot of work to start up, um, commit to starting that peer mentoring program because it is able to change lives and um, create more and more mentors. Um, I know my peer mentor and just my regular mentor have uh, really inspired me to be a mentor myself and that's uh, what I did. So um, the mentee to mentor pipeline, let's keep it going. Um, and yeah, let's uh, help these kids because uh, there's people out here who could really really use it. Thank you so much, Kendall and Rachel. This is, this is just really powerful to, to get your, your wisdom on this. And for everyone in the audience, um, if there's anyone where we didn't answer your question, or we didn't get to it, we will, we'll look those over and just um, check that they might, they, the answers might be in the guide, which we're going to show you how to access. Um, so we'll just go to our resources on the slides. Um, Delia, if you don't mind going to, I think we have our link to the NMRC. Um, here we go. So this guide that Rachel and Kendall have been referencing this whole time and has these amazing communication templates and really clear advice. Um, this is the link here on the NMRC, the National Mentoring Resource Center. So you'll receive this uh, webinar as a PDF, so you'll be able to click the link, um, download it, print it, um, use it. And yeah, we're super excited to launch this for the first time on the NMRC, the first peer mentoring guide. We also have a few other resources available on the NMRC related to peer mentoring. Um, the peer mentoring supplement to the elements of effective practice. This is, this is also on there. And I believe we have um, two more resources. We also have, we can go to the next one. Um, there is a key topics page about peer mentoring. This is also on the NMRC website. Um, so you can kind of see these different drop downs with um, research, research and more information about peer mentoring. And then we also have um, another guide, Building Effective Peer Mentoring Programs in Schools specifically. So basically the NMRC is an awesome library of resources. And um, this peer mentoring guide that we've been talking about throughout this conversation is, um, yeah, just the newest fabulous addition to it with, with the, the Youth Advisory Council's wisdom. So National Mentoring Resource, Dot. Okay. And, uh, oh, thanks. Thanks, uh, Delia. Yeah. National Mentoring Resource Center .org. Um, And you'll be able to find all of these different resources on the site for free. Um, if anyone would like to request no cost help, um, technical assistance for your mentoring program, um, you can request that right through the NMRC. You'll be able to go to the link. Again, you'll get this link through the email after this webinar. So if at any time you want um, technical assistance, advice, support on building your program, um, this is something that we offer for everybody. So thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. Thank you so much, Rachel and Kindle, for all of your time and insight and the creation of this guide.
and we look forward to more more um, of these amazing productions from the, the council. And look out for our email, everybody. You'll also get a survey about the webinar. So if you can fill that out, we'd much appreciate it here at the NMRC. Uh, we have lots of other webinars coming up. Um, our next webinar is on June 2nd about the impact of bullying on young people. So you can sign up for that on the NMRC as well. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us.